Thank you, Lord. We are grateful for everything that you have done for us. We do not take any of them for granted in any way, shape, or form. In trusting God to help us today, there are many contemplations that heaven is very eager to open us into within the 60 days. I'm beginning to perceive that this 60 days might not even be enough. Of course, I know that it's not enough because a day with the Lord is like a time of year. So what is 60 days actually? So, um, I want to calculate what that means to God, our uh, two hours, three hours, and everything. It's it's a drop in an, an ocean because He wants more time with us than we can we can spare. I perceive strongly that he would want us to look critically into the prophecies that came our way yesterday. If you would agree with me, those prophecies were deep. <laughs> and we do not take them for granted at all. I perceive that it will be a guiding light to believe us on earth for the next 48 years up till 2070. If you were here yesterday, you will see the force with which those words were coming out. Did anyone notice? that the messenger was constantly under heavy burden in tears and, you know, consistently so. Because there was a sense of urgency in those messages. So I sat down and by the counsel of God, I summarized the close to one hour prophecy yesterday to 28 points and send them to us here. If you are just coming in, try as much as possible to find a way of getting it. Um, and uh, I've, I will urge our people also to try and upload those 28 points on our website for reference purposes. Because part of the thing that we do not have in the body of Christ is documentation. And so it's important we get our documentation deliberately right both as individuals and as collective, you know, both individually and collectively, rather. And the reason for this is for posterity. I believe that the disciples, they documented some of the words of Jesus, especially the ones they didn't understand, because when you open their understanding, they now started remembering the things that they said. Oh, no wonder he said this to us. No wonder he said that to us. So it's important. I'm saying this to us, that we have to keep that attitude of having a record keeping. A record keeping. 
That is what he meant when he said, concerning my handiwork, commanding me, that is, let us reason together. Uh, what I've said to you before, say it to me again, remind me. Not that, not that I've forgotten, but to remind me and refresh your own mind as well. You will need it on your own way as you go in case you forget, in case you are overwhelmed, in case things are getting so much and the pressure is hot. You will do yourself some good if you can go back to the thing that I've said to you. Okay? I have the word of God there. So uh, my plan today is just to go um, after each of them, but I do not think that, that is the way the Holy Spirit wants me to go. Uh, I, I really wish I can break down most of them uh, from the first point to the last point. But our subject of contemplation will be on the last point, the willing slave. So you can take this to be the part two of uh, come forth and be comforted, okay? If you, if you were here day before yesterday. So you can take this to be the part two of that message, but the title of this is the willing slave. If you go to the last point of the uh, prophecies, the summary of the prophecies yesterday, he says, my people have been put into slavery, okay? They wanted to say slavery. By my own men, whom I gave my word to for liberation. My people are willing slaves, thinking that they are serving me. I need someone to go and tell them, for my people suffer for lack of knowledge. They have twisted knowledge and cannot see. God needs someone that will go to the church and tell his own people that they are willing slaves. So God, before now, our understanding is God needs someone to go to the dying world and tell them of the judgment that is coming and to tell them about heaven, to tell them about hell and all of those things. But right now, God really is looking for someone to go and convert the church. Isn't that interesting? That God is looking for those that he will send to the saints to make the born again born again, again. <laughs> that, that's that, if that's uh, anything to go by. My people have been put into slavery by my own men whom I gave my word to for liberation. God is saying here that he has released his spirit and his word yeah, to his own men, his own people, his own ministers. Out of his ministers, some of them, uh, they've... They've used these words that are meant to be for liberation of the people of God. They've used this authority that are meant to be for liberation. They've used it to enslave the people. And the people also, they believe that being sub subservient or being a slave is one of the cardinals of serving God. They believe that since there is nowhere else to go 
And since God calls the men of God, since God, God calls them, since they represent God, since they are anointed to the teeth, since anything they do uh, to you know, fight back can be seen as an act of uh, disregard, disrespect for which they can be punished uh, or cursed for which God can also be angry with them. So they believe that they should be quiet. They believe they should lie low. They believe they should soak in the laws. They believe no will hear them. They believe it is their word against if they do not want to stand the honest nests. They just want to let the sleeping dog lie. Um, they believe that nobody will believe them. And because they wanted to be in the church, they've been church boy, church girl, they've, you know, more or less been in this community uh, and leaving the community to go do someone, something else will make them look like a like a backslider or something, you know. They do not have anywhere else to go. They can't go to the world to start learning how to go to club, how to go to pop, how to do all those things. And so they believe that they just don't want to be the black sheep. Okay. And some believe that uh, there is a very high cost for rebellion. But in the end, you may just be the only one standing. Um, I was in 200 level in school when I learned, I learned it very early in my university days. We were in the class of about maybe 17 or 21 of us, and we had agreed taking a position against our lecturer that period. There was a particular test that he wanted to do and we decided that we would all speak up to say that we will not do the test. The lecturer had been unofficially briefed about it, so he was waiting to see basically the faces of those who were his authority as a university lecturer. A lot of us were not informed that he had known. Some were informed that he had known unofficially, but I didn't know. And so I thought that getting to the class once I spoke, everybody would, you know, follow me. Or, you know, or once the class uh, governor spoke, everybody would uh, stand up. And so I was waiting for the class governor to speak. He couldn't. He didn't speak. Nobody was saying anything. And I was like, but we agreed this. So I stood up and I spoke. And I said, well, we felt that it didn't give us enough time. And so we believe that I kept saying we, 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 you know, and uh, we, we, uh, we do not think that we should have that test that same day. So as a result of that, the lecturer should reconsider and uh, we should have the, le the, the tests some other time. I just kept seeing that the lecturer kept telling me we or I. I said, we, he, he, at every point in time, he would try to take me back again. We or I, I said, we. Then he said, where are your audience? I, I said, excuse me. He said, look back. You are the only one standing in my class. Do you know what that means? Do you, do you know what I feel like? Is, is there anyone that can join me in this course? Have you ever? taking a position in 
favor of everyone else. You thinking you are speaking for the downtrodden. You think you are speaking for those that their pastors had raped them before. You think you have the idea of what pain feels like for those that are neglected, come down on and taken advantage of in the church, only that you were standing alone. Those you were trying to speak up for, those you are trying to represent, you just discover that they, they are not standing. What kind of feeling do you think you would you would have? What 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 word qualifies how you would feel? I do not think anger would do justice. I do not think being upset would do justice. Uh, I'm I'm just looking for the kind of word that you feel will go you know will 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 be used to qualify that kind of. Uh, betrayed i still think that 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 betray will is still not doing the kind of because like you feel that it's the person that have been raped the person that have been ripped off the person whose you know self-esteem have been battered you will still but you just you just look back and you see that they keep cheering the pastor on. Every day is looking more like because of the kind of pain that the people of God have gone through, they are fast becoming a zombie. The pain has made them to be numb, like they. They have thought about it, maybe there is no way out. And so let's just stay here. Let's just um and that to God is is before I even go to God, to, to me as human is uh, how do you take your eyes off? the fear of God how do how, how do you get to a point where the fear of speaking up or the fear of being attacked or the fear of being alone makes you to choose man over God or make, makes you to choose time over eternity. Or makes you to choose the, the fear for man, for the fear of God. How do we get to the point where we do not even have the fear of God. I don't want to take us to the place of um, thank you for letting know that. Um, is it better now? I was told that I'm breaking up a lot. Is it better now? Is it better now? I need more than a peer so. Is it better now? Thank you. So um, how do you get to the point where conventionally, you forget about heaven. Now, this is me going religious. If you know me very well, I, I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you put God and heaven before me, I can 
tell you categorically that I will choose God because I do not believe that God is heaven. I believe when you take a census, okay, when you take a census, okay, or you take uh, take an analysis of the people of of the categories of those that are in heaven. God is too big for you to count him as one of those you never. <laughs> you know, heaven and earth serve him. Heaven and earth speaks of his glory. So you can't be counting him to uh, part of the things that are created to speak of his glory. I don't know if I'm making sense. All right. So you cannot count the one that created heaven as part of the creatures of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So heaven is a very tiny uh, subset of God. Same way you can count God as part of the things on earth if you are taking census. On earth you count, you take census of trees, animals, humans, you know, and the stars, the galaxy, water, land, all those things, okay? You can count God. Same in heaven. You count angels, you count elders, you put all those things in the box. But God is just outside of those, and he's just looking at all the beautiful things that he has created. I hope I'm not being heretic to you, <laughs> okay? So if you know me very well, I do not... Uh, talk about heaven, making heaven or not making it. I just want to, I just want to find my God. I just want to find the God spot. I just want God. Okay. I believe if God is in hell, I want to be there. All right. If he's in heaven, I want to be there. If he's on earth, I want to be there. So I do not care really whether what is around me is darkness, whether, whether what is around me is hot. As long as I am in God and God is in me and it's so evident that we are together, I don't, I don't, I don't go into the argument of heaven or hell. I, I, I just want God. All right. So, but let us talk about the conventional, you know, discussion of what, a very good salesman would sell to someone that will make him to be convinced to get a product. But I think that the church has sold to the world for a long time in marketing Christianity is to make heaven. Do you agree with me? To make heaven. So it's beginning to look and sound like a promissory note, okay? that you come to Jesus so that you can make heaven, right? So um, I think I'm not heretic again now, okay? I think I'm not heretic that you get to the point where you have, you reckon with yourself and you want to become truthful with yourself that where you started this journey from was the promise that there is a heaven, okay, to go to escape all of these things. And then the fear of not making hell, right? Okay, so you get to this point where you do not even regard the fear of God from the place of reverence, but it's from the place of, I don't want to make hell. I don't want to go to hell. I want to get to heaven. And, and so in, in loving him, you, 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 you are just loving him by virtue of obligation, by the, as a result of the fact that you don't want to go to hell, uh, you know, that fear of not losing out, uh, fear of having given everything to him, then not making heaven. I mean, when I was young, my God. It looks to me like that was the only thing I consider when I want to commit a sin. Oh, wow. And I believe strongly that if I had died then, I would have still gone to hell. The fear 
of choosing God because I want to use him to get to heaven is a sin in its own self. That's not faith. Uh-oh. I hope I'm not losing you now. That's not faith. Each time I stand before my intention to sin, and the first thing I consider is, uh-oh, if I do this, I will make heaven, and, and I need to make heaven for everything I've done, and I choose not to commit that sin, I have sinned. What if the trumpet sounds, where will I end up? Exactly. So am I using God? So it meant while I was uh, a child, I used God a lot in that regard, all right? Because the earth is too terrible. It's too, I mean, we go through so many hassles. We go through so many tough times on earth. So I, I, I just want this God to make me escape this tough time, this darkness, this, 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 this hotness. And I want this God, I just want to use him to escape, you know, uh, darkness in eternity and all of that. So I just want to choose that God because I do not want to make it. So what, 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 what I felt that made me to repent was when I was very young and I saw how people came around me because of the power that God has given to me, because of the ability to see visions and revelations and all of that thing, and because of the grace and the church, okay, because of the invitations that, are, that were pouring in and all of that, not necessarily because they love me as a person or no? they love me. They just love the idea of me. They just, you know, this, you know, boy, as a young boy he can preach from the age of nine, you know, he can, you know, he's, I mean, it's so, what is there not to like, okay? So, so I discovered that, you know, each time I deliberately did not show myself as that, I don't get so many friends, I don't get too many, they come around me just because of those signs and wonders and all of those things and you know, and they look at me like, in fact, they call me Wonder Boy when I was very young. So I felt like I felt it in my stomach. Like I was not like these guys are using me, especially to the church. Like you are using me to get people in. You are using me to increase your crowd. You are using me to to pay your bills. You are using me. You are just using me. Sometimes I felt I felt so exhausted. Sometimes I would preach my life out. I would be so tired. I would be so weak, you know. And I was just going on, going on, going on like that. And then one day I said, God, I hate this. And God said, how many times have you also used me? Let's talk now. Let's talk. Let's talk. How many times have you used me? How many times have you... So you, 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 you've... You felt sick for being used. That's just a blip. That's just a very tiny, you know, experience. When you consider it to what I feel every day, that humans all over the earth call on my name, not because they love me truly, not because they choose me, but because they love what I can give and they choose me to escape hell. Whoa, that was, that was mind boggling for me. I couldn't, I couldn't eat for weeks. I couldn't eat for weeks. It just kept coming to me like, so I, I stand before people and there's this crowd and they are praising God and thanking the Lord. And what I'm hearing in my ears is, my goodness, these guys are just here for what they want. These guys are just here for what they want to get from God. A lot of them are here just because they don't want to, they don't, they don't want to go to hell.
And the kind of uh, denomination that I grew up from, both from the Aladura side, that is Christ Apostolic Church, and on the side of uh, Bible, well, not, not Bible believing, but teaching, Bible teaching church, deeper life, both of them, uh, well, maybe fortunately or, or unfortunately, both of them, interestingly, believe that uh, you do not need to use jewelry and some of the accessories. If you use them, you go to hell. And so you find a lot of people leaving those things behind, not because of the revelation that Jesus brought to them through his love for them and through their love for him, but out of fear of making hell, out of fear of losing out. That is what I'm judging this morning by the Spirit of God to say, it's a sin. Each time you respond to God from the position of doctrines, from the position of fear of hell, fear of losing out, fear of not making heaven, okay, that has made you to stop wearing earrings, that has stopped, made you to stop wearing trousers, that has made you to take a position, okay, now, each time you do that, you are not choosing God. You are choosing the fear of making hell, the fear of not making heaven over God. Okay? Is this clear to everyone? Is it clear? Is this clear to us? Yeah, choosing reward or avoiding punishment, exactly. So a lot of us have gone through our Christian journey like this. A lot of us. And what brought me here, and I stood in the class and I discovered that I was, I thought I was speaking for people, but I was talking for myself. And that day my lecturer told me to get out of the class. And it dealt with me harshly, but then it did something that got me liberated. He had a, a counseling session with me after three weeks and told me, never in your life, wherever you may be, never speak for the crowd. Always talk for yourself. That never left me. Never left me. Because you find that each time you stand to represent a people, you risk the chance of betrayal, embarrassment, and standing alone on your own. Meanwhile, you got motivated because you felt that you are fighting the cause, a good cause. You were trying to speak for the, for the people. But the question you should ask yourself is, why aren't the people speaking for themselves? Now, from that prophecy that I started this, that I started speaking from, you will see that what is clear there is the people are willing slaves. Jeremiah chapter five. My people want it so. The people are willing slaves. Jeremiah chapter 5. I read from verse 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob. The same way God is looking for a man 
that he will send to the church to set the to that he will send to the church to let them know that the born again of this generation must be born again again declare this in the house of jacob and proclaim it in judah saying hear this now O foolish people without understanding who are these who have eyes and see not who have ear and hear not do you not fear me says the lord will you not tremble at my presence who have placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it. And though its waves toes to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain both to the former and latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snare. They set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds. Did you hear me talk about charismatic zookeepers? Did you hear me talk about charismatic zookeepers? Now you see that he's talking about cage. These guys put cage on the ground to catch men and the cage is being likened to the cage that is full of birds. So their houses are full of the seed. Do you see that it's not the house of God? He said, their houses, okay, are full of the seed. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. This is the definition of Jesuru. Is fat, is slick, is using God's word. And as once been delivered unto him to liberate the people, is now using that word to bind the people, to bind them with chains so that they do not go. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy, they do not defend. Shall I not punish them for this thing, says the Lord? Shall I not revenge myself on such a nation as this? An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely. And the priests ruled by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Do you, do you, did, you, did you realize that it didn't say, but my people love to have it so. so and if I stopped about the, 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 the prophets prophesying falsely, it talks about the priest using their own might. So the might of the priest has become their rights. They believe that uh, because you have come to submit to God, to be used of God and to be useful in the service of God and in the house of God, they believe that that's your submission to God and to the authority of the church has now become their own might that they can use. So that might is their rights. So you will see them talking like they own you. You see them talking like you don't have any say at all. So you yourself would even be afraid. Hear me and hear me loud and clear. I don't care whether you are in a, you are in a holiness church. I don't care whether you are in a Bible-believing church. The moment you are afraid of your pastor more than God, you a candidate of dishonor to God. You do not fear God. You do not honor God. You do not regard God. Do you need me to repeat that? I do not care 
where you worship. I do not care who you are. I do not care how many years you have been in the faith. The minute you want to do something and the first thing you do is to consider your pastor and your church above God. You are a candidate of dishonor. You do not fear God. You do not regard God. Is this clear? Is this clear? This is the definition of a willing slave. a willing slave. In this particular uh, Bible passage, he was talking about a prophet and I've decided to prophesy falsely. <laughs> uh, let me let you know that false prophecy is not about using juju or using charms. No, false prophecy is as little as speaking from what you perceive of God and not from God. <laughs> as little as choosing what the people, what you want to say to the people. As little as trying to make people feel good about the words that come out of your mouth. As little as trying to give hope to people or trying to be the center of attraction. I've seen so many of our prophets. Once there is an event or a particular circumstance, that's when you see them talk. They have a way of looking at the atmosphere to speak, especially when they see that people are really hungry and desperate for direction. <laughs> a genuine prophet does not speak to times and seasons. No, a genuine prophet speaks to his God. <laughs> he speaks to eternity. He doesn't speak to time. He doesn't speak to, that's why, Isaiah can say unto us, his child is born, unto us a son is given, and throughout his lifetime, there was no son that was born, there was no child that was given. And he held that word till he died. But many, many, many centuries after Christ was born. I fear prophets, prophecies or prophets that speak to seasons, that speaks to time, that speaks to events. A genial prophet will speak to eternity and it is people that will now begin to say, oh, this many, many years ago. So this was what he meant. Not that any little thing in Nigeria, you already see people that are speaking, oh, this is likely to happen. That is likely to happen. Whenever God is not sending you to speak and you speak just so that you can, you, just so that you can relieve yourself of the pressure of the anointing, you are a false prophet. You know, how many of you know that there is a pressure of anointing? There is a pressure that anointing brings. Is called performance. <laughs> In my very, very early days, I had met with this monster. It's a mighty monster in the church. If you decide to keep your mouth shut, it will look like you are not anointed or you are not graceful. Especially when other prophets are speaking and there are messages everywhere. It will look conspicuously absent. It will look like you are conspicuously absent. Is there a witness here today, or maybe I'm speaking for myself? <laughs> you know, that everybody is now looking for you. That ah, where is DB? Ah, in all of this, what is happening? Ah, ah. And it's a mighty pressure 
that will just make you to. In fact, some people will now come to you directly and say, Adibi, what, what is the Lord saying? Hey, you too. You will now gather every strength inside of you. And then you begin to speak. <laughs> Immediately you fall for things like that, you are a false prophet. And you are walking your way gradually through to the assembly of the workers of iniquity. That Jesus will say to them, I do not know you. So it's a thin line between divinity and divination. It's a thin line between divinity and fortune telling or should say, it's a thin line between miracle and magic. Oh, that monster dealt with me. In my teen years, it dealt with me seriously. The pressure to perform. The pressure to perform. It was, so anytime I stand before God and, and, I'm, and I'm preparing for meetings, that's why when I tell you I don't prepare, I don't prepare, is one is is out of a mighty deliverance that God has made me scale through. Not that preparing is not good, but how do you how do you convince yourself that while praying for that meeting, while preparing for that meeting, you are not preparing from the position of burden or pressure to perform, pressure to show to people that you are truly anointed. And especially when you have heard that people are coming in for that meeting purposely because of you, because they've heard that you will be there. <laughs> it's, it's very thin, let's be truthful with ourselves. You, you may justify, you may call it whatever name, it's very thin. It's a very thin line to convincing yourself. Those days, my teen days, my goodness, um, uh, I, I had a good run. I had a good, I didn't, I didn't regret. If there's any regret I have about my childhood days, is just that I didn't do more for God. Oh, but the ones I did, oh, it was a lot. It was a lot. I would preach in school. I would preach out of school. I would be snaked out of school to preach. After school, I would go and preach. Oh, my goodness. It was, it was back to back, back to back. And a time came when I just had this pressure, this pressure. The next uh, blind that will come for me, uh, so, so the next uh, lame that they will bring for me to pray, the next uh, sick person, the next this, the next that, the next case. The cases were always like, uh, you know, I was like, I would puke, like, you know, I, it was just around me that, okay, if you, if you, you need to soak yourself in this power, you need to soak yourself. And especially when my, my sages were now, you know, doing everything to hide me away from, from women, from, you know, especially when they were trying to let me know that virginity is one of the reasons why I have so much power. That and they were protecting me from, you know, uh, doing something stupid or sinning or, you know, following women that will destroy my anointing, quote and unquote, and to do things that will, you know, so they were doing so much to convince me. Okay. And the more they were doing that, the more I was, I was losing my mind. I was losing my mind. Why is this anointing so important to you? I want my life. I want to be normal. I want us. It was. I was not normal. You know, they hide me from everybody. They, I don't. I mean, I was. I didn't have a childhood at all. You know. So, I. I. I mean, uh, I can't play football freely. I can't go with my friends. You know, everybody is just watching, looking out for me. You know. And so please don't be angry, you know, if you, had, if, you, if you had told me that you wanted to come to my house and I said you should not come, or I, I, I told you and I didn't respond, uh, I may be suffering from PTSD. <laughs> I 
I think that's a good place to laugh. You know, I, I may be suffering from the, the demons of my yester years. I don't want it to get back. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't want to come to that place. I don't want my children to go through the things I went through. You know, I was so exposed. My childhood was just for everybody to grab. I didn't have any, you know, me time and all of that. Yeah. And so it was more like they were doing those things for themselves to use me, you know, to get people into the room. And so I also was doing so much to maintain that pressure. I was doing so much. Lord, since the sages have told me that I have to keep myself for you so that you can keep using me. And as you keep using me, your name will be glorified. And so, Lord, give me this power. Give me this anointing. Give me this fire. Let the devil run away from me. Let my environment let it know that I am anointed and I'm called by God, all of those things. And so that validation uh, it gives me gave me a lot you know to ponder on as to why am i asking for anointing you you will see yesterday if you were here you will hear when the messenger kept saying that why are you doing the things you are doing you too you want to be heard you too you want to be known you too you want to be seen because we are not truthful in that regard each time we are motivated by our ego and our ambition and our need to be seen and the pressure of being visible, we are false prophets. At that point, God is no more the center of your motivation. God is no more the one pushing you to use your gift. This was how the church got to the point of using the gift that God had given to them to weaponize the beast, to weaponize Baal, to weaponize idol, to begin to idolize. And so men began to idolize them because they also couldn't be delivered from the monster, which was the pressure of ministry, the pressure to perform, the pressure to show force, the pressure, it comes, it always comes legitimate. It comes and appears like you are doing it for the good cause. But honestly, ask yourself, if I stop doing this today, will I still enjoy my life? Will I be, will I still be sane? Will I still see myself as, as myself? Okay, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> if men, ref if men stop, um, respecting me for the gift that I have today, or if I say to God, God, take this gift away, and people don't respect me, or they don't invite me anymore, will, will that still make me all feel all right, or, or I will still be, you know, thirsty and hungry to be invited, to be called? It, Maybe maybe you are, you, are, you, are, you are never in my shoes, okay? Maybe you are never in my shoes. Uh, those days, my sages, they will even go as far as uh, making contact um, with international platforms so that they can invite them to preach. Not because God is sending you, but because you just, this is the only thing you know how best to do. This is, if it's taken away from you, it's like you're useless. You can't do anything more. You know, uh, here was I running away from preaching. But then I started seeing many of my sages, people around, you know, trying to establish contact internationally so that they can go and preach. It, it was so alien to me in those days. You know, I would hear some of them making contact on my behalf. To say, oh, we, we got this boy here in Africa, so wonderful, so sensational. Uh, we, we just want you to look for preaching engagement for him. I'm like, excuse me, is this how is this how this thing should be working? Should it be working like this? You know, we don't have we don't we are not ready to have some conversations in the church. 
we are not really ready. Is that godly? Is that godly? So I get to the United States and then I just come for vacation and I have one of my sages like that. Once he hears that I'm traveling out, he will say, don't worry, I'll call you back. I'll call you back in 10 minutes. In fact, I stopped calling him. I, I, just, I just stopped calling him. Because once he knows that I'm out of the country, especially on vacation, he will be calling ministries to look for preaching engagement for me. And one day I said to him, why are you doing this? He said, your voice cannot be a low voice. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot be on a low profile. God has given you so much. And it reminded me of when Jesus' brothers came to him and said, well, if you are disanointed, go show yourself to the people. The pressure for showing. Pressure for performance. Thank you. Someone said, I can't imagine what happened to Michael, Michael Jackson as a kid playing out here. Yeah. I mean, I may not have experienced it on the scale of Michael Jackson, but trust me, man, he was ugly. He was really ugly. I, I, I it's a, and I, and I'm being truthful to say, I, I think, I think, I, I think I, I, I still have PTSD. That's the truth. I, I just, if you, once you tell me as a religious person that you are coming to my house, I, I just, I'll just tell you, please don't come here. I can meet you anywhere. I can meet you in house of prayer. I can meet, don't, don't, don't come to my house. Don't know my children. Don't know, just, just let me be, please. Because it wasn't, it wasn't palatable at all. Um, it wasn't palatable. You know, I couldn't reconcile the performance, the show that we put up and our sacred place, you know, to lie, to throw Jesus under the bus and all of those things. I, I saw lie, you, you raw lie in the church, you know, raw lie. And I look at it, my goodness, you know. Yeah. It's so deep. That's why I'm, I'm taking it slowly because... I do not want to rush it so that it doesn't look like, oh, um, this heretic, are you saying we should not do this? Are you saying, no, I'm giving you my, my own life experience. God delivered me. What, what, I, what, the, the, what Jesus is to me today wasn't what Jesus was to me when I was preaching in my childhood days. I'm so much liberated everything I know today is Jesus. I know many things in the church in those days uh, but Jesus. I know so many things but Jesus. That, that's the truth. Right now, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even want to preach. I don't even want the podium that God is not given to. I mean, I I don't want it. <laughs> like, I don't. You know, in those days, some of the sages would say, all oh, the gift that God has given to you, is this how it will die? People need this gift out there. People need to be liberated. And, you know, there's always a motivation and justification for a thief stealing. Do you know that? If, if, if you catch a thief now, it will tell you I'm, I was hungry, uh, this uh, something. You, you know, there is always this legitimate. He looks so legitimate, but he is false. He's, he's terrible. If he's not God motivated, if he's not God driven, if, he's, if, it's, if, if you are driven because there are poor people, if you are driven because there are sick people, if you are driven because the world is uh, going the precipice of sin, if you, no, no. No, those are secondary. God could do that without you. You have to be driven because God sent you. You have to be driven because God. And, and, it's, and that part of God sending me has to come from the genuine love and relationship between you and your God. Otherwise, a false prophet.
I was, I was, I was dying inside of me as a teenager. I just, I just want Jesus. Is it, I mean, what brought me, to, what brought me here in the first place? What brought me to church? It's Jesus. Is this, is this how, is this, is this the kind of burden Jesus gives to people? The kind of bondage rather Jesus gives to people that people are under heavy burden, every, every bondage of, of performing every every bondage of of trying to show themselves like I'm tired. Can I not just be free with my Jesus? Can I can I not? My God, it was a sin for me to look at my pastor to turn down a, an engagement, like a preaching engagement. It was just a sin. They would then preach my, they would preach, they would, they would make me look like a sinner. That you are turning God down. The opportunity to to, to to show God to the world, you are turning it down. And I'm like, I don't feel, I don't think God has sent me to do this. My life is not consistent with my message. Sir, I lied yesterday. And they knocked me out of it to say, well, don't we all lie? Don't we all do all those things? Especially my mom kept kept going to most of the stages to say, Daniel lies a lot. He lies effortlessly. He, he has this insecurity around him. Can you just help me? They say, don't worry, all of us lie. Those of us that have the anointing of God, the devil tries to bring something. Don't worry. Don't worry. The hand of God is on him. The hand of God. And I kept telling myself, if the hand of God is on me, can't he deliver me from lying? Can't he deliver me from, from this thing? Can I just not serve him and just know him for who he is and not just that I'm knowing him because the next thing is he must send me out. He must send me to preach. He must send me to preach. My greatest fear was trying to preach because my friend preached a wonderful message yesterday. Trying to raise the dead because I hear that my friend has now started raising the dead. It was my greatest fear outdoing someone, outsmarting someone, outperforming someone, just being on the lips of everybody. DB, 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 DB. I, I was just tired of it. These are the very thin lines that we have worked on in the name of Jesus. And that's why we have met ourselves down this line. Some people, if they really have their way, which is what they always tell themselves, they would really want to stand up to say, I quit. I just want it simple. And, I, <laughs> and the Lord is saying to me today that those that are still sitting there to say, well, I just don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. The truth is you don't fear God. You fear man more than God. You don't fear God. You don't fear God. How would you be afraid of human like you that can sleep and may not wake up tomorrow? How will you be afraid of a, of a human? The authority God gave to him, you fear that authority so that you won't be cursed than the God that called you, the God that redeemed you. So the prophets prophesied falsely. Not that they went to garbage, but they practiced idolatry. They are motivated to prophesy by everything but Jesus. They don't know what else to do other than to preach. So they have to keep preaching, keep preaching, keep preaching, keep preaching, keep preaching. And when they preach, 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 they get to a point, they say they are retiring. 
I don't understand. Retiring from what? From calling? Or you saw it as a job? From active service? Whoa. So what, what does that make of you? You are now in inactive service to your God. Let's keep it simple, shall we? The priests, they have seen might as right. You see some pastors speaking, talking down on their members. There was one that made me cry. The young lady had decided to give her time to God. I don't know what motivated her, whether God called her to do that or she just felt she needed to do that, okay? And she was coming, doing those things, sweeping the floor, being available for the church, being used at home, you know, to stay with the children of the pastor, keep them in company, like a nanny and all of those things. And, you know, and this pastor's wife was just using her. Um, she wouldn't have a time to go see her parents. She wouldn't have a time to do, you know, things. You know, she was held down, uh, the, you know, in service, okay, in service, all right? of uh, God to his pastor and to his pastor's wife. Then one day something happened and the pastor's wife slapped this. I mean, you raise up your hand to slap the people that God has brought to serve you. You get physical, like you get very violent and you, you know, if not that you thought that your might over them is your right. If not that you thought that if you do that over and again, they cannot go. There is nowhere else they can go. Especially when you have uh, been financially responsible for them or you have done one thing or the other for them to keep them standing. Some of our pastors cannot even stand their church members having more money than them. You can't even do business with your pastor and be sure that you will be adequately compensated. We've had terrible cases. Aren't we a case study? Even to ourselves. And you sit there, you sit there, you experience things like that. I'm talking to you now. You experience things like that and you keep quiet just because you want peace to reign. Excuse me, peace cannot reign in your life. Why? Because you are one of the willing slaves. You heard me right. You are one of, your, of the willing, willing slaves. You are one of those that will give excuse even give excuses as to why you must not touch the anointing or touch not my anointed or what, they, what, 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 what verse do you use and do my prophet no harm. When God is looking for someone that will call out this evil for what they truly are. But what do you do? You want peace to reign. You don't want to argue with your pastor. You don't want to be in a position of being seen as a black sheep. It touches you on your right shoulder, you keep quiet. It touches you and you felt in your body that this touch is not, excuse me, am I the only one that someone will touch you and you know that that touch is not an agape touch, is not a platonic touch. There is something to this touch. Do I have a witness here or I'm just talking for myself? Is it, is it? I mean, and then you, <laughs> you keep quiet. You just keep quiet sheepishly. You keep quiet. You, you've been abused many times and you take it because you are a willing slave. No. Uh, 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 
I'm, I'm really trying to hold myself. I, I don't want to, I don't want to just, you know, I, I don't want to deviate. I, I just, there's a place I want to touch by the grace of God. Because we've looked at these people will say, we say, oh, he's a man of God. They are the ones doing this. This is what the church is doing. But we are not pointing to the followers. A leader can get away with what he's doing because they are foolish followers. You and I have been foolish in this regard. Someone touches you. You cannot turn to the person to say, this is inappropriate. Please don't touch me. It starts from when you are under anointing. And man of God is in the crowd. And he comes and he touches and he lays hand on your head. Excuse me, the Bible says, lay hand suddenly on no man. You don't do that. You don't. Why would you lay your hands on me? Why? I stand in the church not because of you, but because of God. Question. Have you ever felt very uncomfortable when a man of God touched your head and you didn't tell him so? How many of you here has been touched on your head and you didn't like it, but you kept quiet. <laughs> Sheepishly. <laughs> and he was touching your head. You couldn't say, excuse me. Take that hand off my head. Now, you stood there. You are that willing sh slave. Oh, yes. God is calling you out now. She do we have said, oh, let's call out the pastor. Mm -mm. God will call them out. God will send those that are calling them out. Uh, there is judgment going on in the church, but you, you yourself, you yourself, God needs to, God is calling you out too. God is calling you out too. There is nothing wrong in praying for someone and feeling the urge to lay your hands on them, the first thing you do is you move close to them and you say to them, are you comfortable with this? Because this is what I feel like doing. Say it, ask. It's called permission that the person has come to the church to serve God doesn't give you the right to think that you can touch any part of them. It is wrong. Have I not been in a meeting that just, you know, uh, abruptly like that, the spirit just started moving and see if it is spirit led, it takes to, oh my God. I don't know if you get my point. If it is spirit led, as I'm bringing it upon your head, you will know that, okay, this is God. You'll be comfortable with it. I also will be comfortable with it. But you have the mind of Christ in you. I'm saying you have the mind of Christ in you and you stood in that church and someone touches you on your head or touches you in any part of your body and you, you, you receive the witness from your spirit that that was not meant to be so. Did you ever stand up against it? Did you?
That's why if you can read me from the tone of my voice, I've been saying it for more than one year now, that a time will come, they will be slapping pastors, they will be breaking their teeth, uh, teeth, they will be beating them physically, they will beat them to pop. You see, because the followers refuse to do it, God will now raise goats outside. God will raise people outside to do it. They will disgrace your pastor because you have refused to call him out. You have refused to straighten him out. Are we not supposed to be high on, sharpening high on? Did God ever give one high on more power to sharpen the other? Did he say senior high on more sharpen junior high on? He says high on sharpens high on, period. Which means I can sharpen you, you can sharpen me. It is nonsense talk. And the pastor is the one that can talk. Church member cannot talk. Can't even raise any, any concern. You can't raise any displeasure. You can't have any disagreement in the church. Says who? Did Paul and Barnabas not fight? Did he, did he, did he, did he change anything? The, 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 the disciples, did they, not, did, did they not have any, did they not have issues that they looked at James at the church of Antioch when Paul was going to preach to the Gentiles as Peter was preaching to the Jews? Did they not have things that they looked at and then they wrote communicate to the church that this is their position for Gentiles that want to be, you know, grafted into the, into the, into the fold of the Jews. These are the things they have to do to abstain from blood, to abstain, to do this, to do this. Was, was it not after many, many deliberations that many of them came out of disagreement? How is it that it's only the pastor that God gave voice? Where is your own voice as a follower? You are a willing slave. A willing slave. And the answer is not just to say, hey, you know what? From today, anybody that does anything, mm -mm 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 -mm. it has to be by the prescription of the Holy Spirit. To be a follower, you have to first be the follower of Jesus. Oh my God. You'll be the follower of Jesus so that the Holy Spirit will start doing a work inside of you. So, so that even with your standing, even without opening your mouth, with your standing, eh? anybody that is not in God and wants to do anything that is of God will know that they can't come to you. I don't know if I'm communicating. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> when I talk about to do, is because it is by mutual consent that I know my the extent of the relationship that we have. Based on what God has delivered me from for my childhood, I don't use men. I seek that God will make them. And if he uses me as a vessel to make them, he doesn't still give me right over their lives. That your father does not mean you should, you should, you should breathe down on your neck, on the neck of your so-called sons and daughters and sit on them. You should not have any life anymore because you are a father. Have you had some of your pastors or some of our people that because we respect them, they want to decide the affairs of your life decision and you also have willingly or knowingly or knowingly you have also allowed them to do it
somebody does not care what you go through financially. He does not care where you are, whether you have paid rent or you have not paid rent. He does not care. He just says that, oh, you have not, you have not uh, been committed to this ministry. You are not, uh, I mean, uh, last year you gave, we are not seeing anything. And you too should say, oh, uh, sorry, things have been a bit hard. And then the next thing they tell you is, well, you have to choose to do God's own first. First and foremost, should you even be told that? Should, no, should you even be told that you must be committed to those that have taught you? Should, should it be an obligation or out of relationship? One of the very trusted men told my, my friend, my very, very wonderful friend in Ekiti, that his angels are angry with him. This is a very delicate that I'm not talking of a, 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 an unsound man of God. I'm talking of a, you know, someone that we respected myself and my friend said uh, his angels in heaven, they are angry. They are not happy with him. And that they brought the matter to him from heaven. And so he has to really sit with the matter and judge the matter. And uh, part of the thing that my friend has to do is to send 10 million naira to him. He has to send 10 million. See, I'm not talking of fake men of God. <laughs> Ah, the day my friend called me and told me this, I packed my car. In fact, I told my driver that I should just be going. I alighted from the car and I was trekking and I was crying. I was in tears. I said, Lord, even those we respect, even those that we have seen their lives, that they followed you, they followed you. Oh, my God. When will this nonsense stop? And I turned to my friend, I called him, I said, are you, are you, don't tell me you are going to do that. He said, ah, trust, trust me, trust me. If we would die, let us die here. How do you give people so much control over your life because they are called, because they are of God? You do not have any calling. Your head is dry. Your head does not have oil. Or something is wrong with your own head. In all of the authority that God gave to Adam, God never gave man authority over man. Never. Not anywhere. He gave man authority over the beast, over the field of the hair, over the beast, over the food, over everything, but never man to man. No. You, I'm trying to make this as practical as possible. I don't want it to be a general message. I want it to. I want to drive it home because we 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 have shied away from most of these things, and we have now become a joke to ourselves. We have now become even disgusting to one another. You go to a movement, a ministry, a church, a whatever you call it, to you like the idea of the service of God and you just want to give your time to serve. Does that make you a slave? Please answer me. Let's be very practical here. You are the one who you use your two leg, your two leg to enter the place where you say, this is what you want to be doing. You want to be doing this. You want to offer this service. You want to offer this service to the glory of God and free of charge with your time. It's your time. It's your money. You use your two legs to enter. And from the day you entered, exit was a problem. 
exit. Bon, c'est problème. Sometimes we should be asking ourselves questions. JP, whatever has commencement date must have expiry date. Even if it is friendship, the only thing that does not have expiry date is when you are a destiny partner to somebody. We meet to part, we part to meet. Is that not the case? Do you have friendship in perpetuity? If not that you, it is divinely arranged and it is a destiny thing, it is an eternal thing in time. Yes, there are relationship like that, God has blessed me with a few. But I know that we are likely to leave this earth together. Very, very few. But not the one that you decide to serve someone and then it has now become a burden on you. If you are not there, it's a problem. Even when they are talking to you, they are talking to you anyhow, they are, they are shouting on you, they are, they are screaming on you, they are banging. Who, nobody, you, you don't shout on me, you don't. It's how, how, how? Are you God? We've been willing slaves. We have allowed God's people, God's men to enslave us. That judgment is on our head and we will be judged if we do not repent. And the place of repentance is to go back to our first love. What brought you to God? Was it man of God? Was it to be a fool? Was it to be dumb? Was it to look like your brain is off your head? No regard, no honor to you. You attend the church service. They said it's six to 10. They extend before beyond 10. No, no respect for your time. Nothing like apologizing to you. No, nothing like to even take permission from you. They invite you for a meeting. They come late. You sit there. You as the choir or the church, whatever choir, they told you that you should sing 30 minutes more because the man of God is in the hotel room and you did not revolt to say, no, what are we doing? I'm not, a, is this a joke? Is this a, is this a circus? So am I feeling in a space? And the man of God comes, no regard to the people that have been waiting for him for long. And he comes all, all looking anointed and, and frowning his face. And, and I mean, what, what, what is this? What kind of service are you going to give to God? Which honor will God take? Because you have rudely, rudely, you have disregarded. Oh my goodness. Do you, do, you, do you know why God punished Moses? Why did God punish Moses? Anybody please help me for striking that rock two times or for talking down on God's people. Anyhow, which of them? Someone help me, which one? Striking it twice, the rock twice, or talking down on the people? You said you are stiff necked people. Striking the rock twice was second. It was because it spoke down on the people. Who first used the phrase, these people are stiff-necked people? God or Moses? Please help me. Who was the person? It was God. Good. Do you think that because God used that to Moses, do you think Moses was now qualified to use that to the people before God? Do you think so? 
Do you think so? If you look at the verdict of God, he said, because you did not honor me before the people. Because he stood there and he was motivated by his anger to strike the rock twice. If he was not angry, he wouldn't have struck that rock two times. It was because he was angry and he said, you stiff necked people. <laughs> and God said, <laughs> you don't dare. That I speak to them and yeah, I choose to speak to them and I did not put it in your mouth. And that is God and Moses. <laughs> and I need you to understand the relationship between the two of them. God came down to, to introduce himself one day to say, if I go talk to anybody among you, I talk to the person like face to face, like a man talk to his friend. That person is Moses. He's not anyone other than you now. That same person is who God is now punishing because he, dis he disregarded God's people. Be careful. That is the extent of the regard that God expects his own men to have for his people. But alas, these people, they've given, they've given that, they've relinquished their voice. They've given their voice so they can be harassed. It's okay to be harassed. They keep, they keep it cool. Even without touching their private parts, they have been raped many times. Because when you take the greatest shame you can ever give to a man, it's not having sex with him. It's removing, removing self-esteem from him. If you ask rape victims, they will tell you that the major thing that made them to be, to feel terrible was the self-esteem that has been taken away from them. the self-esteem that I've been taking away from them. Because it's, it, everything points to demeaning, re, you know, shaming, removing that self-esteem from them. You, they, they, they look down on themselves like they are nobody. Now that's how the, the, the followers have been. That's how we've been in the church. Like we are nobody. It's, it doesn't feel right until the pastor says so. Even when your husband is talking sense, because he's not pastor, it's so bad that some women can kneel down for their pastors, but they cannot kneel down for their husband. You are just stupid. I'm, 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 I'm sorry to... I'm, I'm, I'm been calming myself down. I'm not, I'm not about people kneeling down. If you like, don't, it's what works for both of you. Mm -hmm. If you like, no, but see, don't regard someone more than he should be regarded. Who do you think God regards more? The husband or your husband or your pastor? Let me just tell me. Who do you think God regards more? Your husband or your pastor? There are sensible people here. Very sensible people. I thought somebody would say pastor. If God will hold someone responsible, it will be your spouse. If you are not married, it will be your parents. So as a child of God, except you have found your father, in the Lord <laughs> and not role model 
Father. Father, that you have seen his vulnerability. Father, that you have seen his pain. Father, that you have seen his good side, his not so good side. And God has helped you to still honor him. Now, that person is who God can re, can, re, uh, can you know, uh, help me here. request of your life from okay uh -huh. god can say okay db you are responsible for tolu now because you are our father but if db is a role model to tolu and tolu is thinking that god will regard db more than our husband that is a foolish conclusion. Is my illustration clear? Which means if your pastor is not your father, God will regard your husband more than your pastor. Are you listening to me, please? I'm making it as practical as it can be. Except your father is your pastor, that you are here. God has used his weakness, his strength, everything, and you is so clear in your spirit that the two of you, you, you are born to do this father son relationship. Even your husband will have regard for it, he will come, even if he does not totally agree, he will come to accept it. But if your pastor is not has not gotten to that point, and I'm not saying role model, oh, I like him, I like how he talks, I like how he preaches. No, 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 no. If your pastor is not your father, when God calls a role call, the first person he will require your life from is your husband. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So, can your husband slap you? It's a yes or no for me. Can your husband slap you? Uh -huh. No, don't say her. It's a yes or no. Because this one that they say, oh, he has paid my bride price, that means he can do anything. Can he slap you even with bride price? The answer is no. So if your husband, that God will require your life from, or your wife, that God will require, oh my God, <laughs> that God will require your husband from, because we don't know that God will require both from, uh, uh, both of you from each other. Oh my God. We think, <laughs> oh God. So if that cannot happen, what gives you that thoughts that your pastor can tamper with your self-esteem and go scot free with it. Let me just stop because it's uh, we won't leave here today. I'm not I'm not I'm not a traditional person. Mm -mm. If you like, nail down for your husband. If you like, don't nail down for your husband. Whatever works for the two of you is fine for me. But there's a lot of high service that the followers of the people of God has done in the church 
and it is sacrilegious. What you cannot do for your husband, you do so much more to your pastor. What you cannot do to your wife, you do it to others outside. These things are on just scale. They are on just scale. They are on just scale. The, the one that really, I mean, I, I will just say this and I'll stop. It's so <laughs> you are really uh, you know makes me wonder is uh, some pastors just feel that because you are a member of the church, uh, they can they can greet you anyhow they like. They see you today, they hug you, they hug you, they hold you, hold you so tight. They see you tomorrow, they, they almost want to say you come and sit down on their laps because they are your pastor. Some of them, they see you with your husband. That is when they will now be sending you useless message. Maybe they want to show that, they want to show to your husband that I, I, don't, I don't get it. What I'm pointing at is that we have no honor for ourselves. We have no regard. If I want to hold somebody or hug somebody, at least in the body language, there should be a seeming acceptance. Am I old school or, or this is how it should be? I don't know. And they will hold you, they will hug you. You, you are not comfortable with it, you will still be laughing. Is that not deception? Is that not deception? What is wrong in, um, I, I, I want to hug you, is it okay for me to hug you? Some hand holding, some side hugs, some full hugs are so they are they are abusive. It's like you are in an abusive relationship, whether you like it or not, kind of relationship. No regard, no honor. I just laugh. <laughs> See, man of God, the next thing is either you are bowing, bowing your head or you are kneeling down. What happens to standing like a, a tree? No, what happens to eh, that you have even said, sir? Is it not enough? Tolu is even saying side up. I'm even saying, must you even touch somebody at all? If you are looking for what, go and meet your wife at home now. If you are looking for somebody to hold, go and hold somebody now. Excuse me, if you want to hold somebody, is it? If you, 
Will a man not know that a woman is okay being hugged? Can a man not perceive that is because I mean I'm a man, I'm not a, a woman, so I need a woman now. If I if I see you and you, you smile at me and you know I'm coming towards you, is it not that I will see some signs that you are okay with hugging you before I come to hug you? Because I'm, I'm, I just want to be sure that, you know, maybe I'm overthinking this. Anything that you do not accept and you keep quiet, it is deception and you are allowing things to first and to go on. And if you were not raped, if you were not abused, you have indirectly given that man of God opportunity to go and abuse someone else. Maybe if you had stopped it, maybe it won't happen to the next person. How about that? It's just a food for thought. Maybe our silence, our acceptance of things like this has made it gone, it has gone for so long that most of this People think that it is acceptable, it is okay to do. We list it. I stop here. It is two, three. Why are you hearing this? God needs you. God needs you. God needs you to change the narrative. God needs you. And that's why you are hearing it. Deepen your love for your God first. Let nothing, let nothing mute your voice when it comes to your love for your God. Love your God and have reverent fear for him such that you can stand anybody because of your love for your God and because of your reverent fear for your God. That is a way to stop this nonsense. Never allow any human to come ahead of your God. Very, very simple and plain. And deliberately, you must live such life. And it is only through the Holy Spirit that you can live such life. In fact, by the time you invest heavily in the person of the Holy Spirit, it is very easy for you to do. The problem is, the challenge is, you are trying to summon courage. You don't need courage. Are you listening to me? You don't need courage. Don't, be, don't follow that pep talk. Revolt. Stand against it. I'm not speaking motivational. I'm not speaking uh, moral to you. No. You need the Holy Spirit to stop this madness. It is only the Holy Spirit. You don't even need respect. You don't even need respect. You need the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes respect in Africa, for me, is borderline subservience. You can be very stupid with respect in, in Africa. But with the Holy Spirit, it will first teach you to love your God above all else, to fear him and the kind of fear it will teach you that that fear shouldn't be fear for hell or fear for losing out or fear for missing heaven or fear for, you know, obligatory, whatever. No, it's reverent fear. That you know that when you sin, instead of running away from him, he's the first person you are looking for. The relationship that, oh, I've done something. I'm looking for my father because I've done something. Not that, oh, I've done something. I'm running away from my father. That fear will make you to stand against anybody that wants to be God to you. Anybody. Even your spouse will know that, hmm, uh -huh. 
there are things I cannot touch. I can't go, I can't cross my line. But this one that they grab you from behind, you don't like it or it's not like you want it. Don't get me wrong. But you kept quiet. You didn't say anything. You let it slide. That guy will now go and grab somebody else and have his way with the person. Do you know what? If God is judging, God will start the judgment from you. When he grabbed you, you didn't slap him. When he grabbed you, you didn't make a scene. When he grabbed you, you kept quiet. You gave an indirect approval for him to go and do it with another person. No, yeah, first know your God. That's good. Then honor people. Yeah. And part of honoring people is slapping them into order. In fact, it is honor to, 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 to God and to people if you slap them into order. It is dishonoring if they touch you and you don't say anything. You have dishonored God. You have dishonored yourself. You have dishonored your fellow man that will be, that will enter into a deeper hole because you allowed it. Even the person that paid your bride price, sometimes when they grab you from the back, sometimes if you are not in the mood, will you not say you are not in the mood? Are you a zombie? If you say you are not in the mood, won't you move you Someone will now do it, you now keep quiet, you see, because he's a man of God. And God starts judgment, he will knock your door. You cannot escape. You cannot escape being judged. He will knock on your own door. He will start with you. Thank you. If you are married, you have dishonored your husband. In fact, that's another one. So just look at the dishonored list. Starting from God, yourself, your fellow woman or man, and your husband. In fact, your children too. Because when they get to hear the story, they will just look at you. <laughs> and mommy, I don't know that this is how cheap you are. That is cheap. Let me stop here. How many of you agree with me that will agree with me if I say this message has not finished? <laughs> and take it from me. I'm coming back. And I'll be mentioning cases deliberately. This one is not a talk on down. No, no, no. no. Some things have gone for too long. For too long. I've gone for too long. I, was, I will tell a story, full for thought, because I want it to be thought-provoking. I, I want you to lose your sleep on this topic so that this nonsense will stop. God will find in you a man, a woman, that he can send to the church. A young girl had two brothers. The parents were jolly good fellow unbelievers. Got born again and loved the Lord and gave, you know, they are all to God, including their families. And there was this man of God, true story, this man of God. See, well, we believe he was a praying man of God. Whenever the family, husband and wife, whenever they were going anywhere, they, can, they would take the children to the house of the man of God. They say he was a family man. He had his family too. Sometimes this man of God can come over to their house. He uses their house as a... Uh, a place where he can rest, 
a place where he can fast if he wants to consecrate himself to God. So one day, everybody had gone, remaining three children. This man of God came out and sent the two men, the two boys, sent them out, remaining the girl, and brought out his manhood and was running, chasing the girl all around the house. And the girl couldn't believe what, what was happening. She couldn't process it. She was like, I don't understand. What's this? Long story short, the pastor, the man of God, raped the girl. And the girl was crying, was in tears, was so eager, waiting for her parents to come back. The parents came back. She remembered something. She said, as the, as the pastor was chasing her, the pastor kept saying, it will be your word against my word. Even your parents will not believe you. You have shown tendency that you were wayward. So they will not believe you. And so, I want to cry, but I'm holding myself. And so the, the, the parents came back and this girl was, you know, all, you know, just processing the whole thing was losing her mind, called her mother, called, you know, and everything. And the next thing, the mother started beating her. That she was the one that seduced the man of God, if ever it happened. That that man of God can never do that. It can never happen. That she was the, was the, and then the father also joined. That you see, you are in SS2, SS3. You are starting wearing skin biscuits. You are doing this. You are doing that. We've prayed to you. We've done everything to you. I don't know why you, you, are, you are like this. You have decided to. And that was how they lost the girl. They lost the girl. And the pastor would come around. The girl wouldn't even fight anymore. The girl would just submit herself to the pastor. So the pastor was just sleeping with the girl. Sleeping with the girl. Under their nose. Sleeping with the girl. By the time the girl was 19, the girl had become a pro at doing this. All because it was our word against the word of the pastor. They didn't believe. Throughout, they did not believe. Let it be a food for thought for you. How many of such we've kept quiet? And we see them singing like Beyonce, church girl. And we are the one that will say, well, how will Beyonce sing her song? Why would she sing her song? Shut up. She's singing her experience. How she came to church and how church treated her. These are the people that found their way to the world. And you will see how they are attacking the church from outside. You will think that they are, they are sent against the church. No, it's because they are, now, they are now in a place where they think they have the voice to stand and stop fight against what they've done. When people in the church will not talk, they are doing the talking. Food for thought food for thought. Go and sleep if you can. If you can, because this, this, this is how we do this, what we do. We are so good at allowing these things to slide like a normal matter. See, it's a judgment on you if you do nothing on this, because your ears have heard it and you are implicated. Oh, yes, you are. This is not, uh, it's not to, we are just talking, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. No, 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 no. no. Make up your mind to be that one person that will stop this nonsense in your corner. You stop it right there. Stop it right there. So I'm not speaking so that you just hear and see who oh, what what is what is Samuel. <laughs> don't 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 play with me. <laughs> don't play with me.
just just hold hold on those questions because I will answer them. God doesn't take gifts back, but then by what spirit are they operating? We'll, we'll go there. We'll go there. They are this. I have defined to you what false prophecy is. That is exactly what false life too is. Once you start giving excuses to your weakness, God help you not to do worse things than this man that we are talking about. It can never be Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not Holy Spirit. <laughs> Because when the Holy Spirit wants to live in you, maybe you'll be willing. Does it force you? Even the Holy Spirit, let me stop. Because even the Holy Spirit does not, does not lay hand on you suddenly. Won't you invite him to your life before he comes? Is even a very honorable spirit. Does he just grab you anyhow? Does the Holy Spirit that you are mentioned, does he even grab you anyhow? You allow, you allow anybody to just be raining on your palate. It has to stop. For the sake of your children, it must stop. God be with you. If you can sleep, go and sleep. If you can't, cry to God so that the Holy Spirit will make you that one person that God will find and send back to the church. That prophecy kept ringing in my ears. Who will I send? Who will I send? Who will I send to tell my people? I want, I want people to come and report you to me. I want your pastor to call me that you disrespected him, you slapped him. That is what I want to hear. Oh, not all men, especially those of the brotherhood. Fear God. <laughs> oh, no, man. Don't even respect men. Oh, no. Respect is borderline hypocrisy. Uh -huh. Oh, no, man. Fear God. Oh, no, man. Don't fear men. And honor God. Fear God. Oh, no, man. God bless you. God keep you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. See you this morning. Good morning.